Uh, I should include radio in my resume more clearly because actually I began my career in radio. I used to um, study history at St. Stephen's by day, but family circumstances were such that I had to work my way through college. And one of the ways that I worked my way through college used to be by freelancing with uh, radio and the very first TV that began in India, just in the Delhi radius. And I used to read uh, the news uh, on the external services, which were at night. And I used to read uh, commentaries. They had these wonderful political commentaries because we had just finished that war with China and all kinds of things were happening. Um, plus, I did a thing called Mirror of the World, on, on, which is one of the earliest programs on television and was very popular. But coming back to radio, about seven years ago, I was called to do a television series in Italy called Un Medico in Familia. This was the story of a uh, an Indian immigrant that comes to Italy and the problems created by immigrants and created for immigrants. And against me was this very famous Italian actor called Lino Bamfi, great Italian comic legendary actor. And so we played this television series. When I finished that television series, I was coming back to India and they came to me Radio One in Italy and they said, We've got this very interesting idea. Would you do it? And what it was, was two people that are communicating uh, on the internet. And one is a man who calls himself Sandokan. And he pretends to be Sandokan, but living today. And he enters the life of this Italian housewife who's got all kinds of day-to-day -day problems, her children, her family, her job, her husband, and all kinds of, kinds of things. No, she doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have a husband. So, basically this becomes an immense love story between the two. But she says, how can I believe you? You keep talking about all these... Because this guy goes into all kinds of flights of imagination. You know, Bill Gates came to see me. This is how Windows got invented because he came to see me. This is how... He creates all these fantastical stories. <coughs> and this series went on and absolutely held Italy in raptures for six months, uh, broadcast five days a week in Italian. And it was fascinating because people wanted to know what the end of the story will be. Who is this guy? Will they ever get together again? And in the end, of course, they do get together. And it turns out this guy is the captain of a ship. Um, a cargo ship called Sandokan. So a lot of the stories he makes about the sea and all that are actually true. Um, and a lot of the <coughs> examples that he gives about Sandokan and his life are derived from that and somehow work through his ship. It's very clever writing. It just shows what good writing can do to hold people. But yeah, I did that for six months and it was a very successful uh, radio show. The first reason is we don't make films with that in mind. We don't say this film is going to win an Oscar, starting out. Here in general, we make a film and then think, Achha, which one should we submit for our best, best uh, film category? The studios look at it differently. The certain films they make purely for commercial reasons. Other films they make because this is a great story and maybe it'll work, but it's certainly something we can push at the Oscars. So they have that Oscar strategy in mind from the beginning. That's one. Secondly, the kinds of films that we submit to win the Oscars generally are not likely to win. Because, uh, in general, any film that has songs and dances in it, that's not a musical by definition, but it's a dramatic film, is not going to win. 
thirdly, the kind of um, people that constitute the membership of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences is something you have to study very carefully if you want to win the Oscars film. They're largely white. They're largely in their 50s and 60s. They're largely conservative. Many of them are Jewish. There are lots of emotional ties they have with Europe to start with. In fact, I'd say of the 60-odd Oscars won in the past years, over 50 have come foreign language films. Over 50 have gone to European films. Six to Asia as a whole. Uh, so you realize there is a pro-European bias there as well. And they want films of genuinely high quality and generally deeply human stories have an edge in the Oscars. Um, so if we want to win Oscars, firstly we have to start out thinking about winning the Oscars, planning films like that. Secondly, making sure that it appeals to the demographic of the, of the voters. And thirdly, a very important aspect is that we must set aside enough budgets for their promotion. You know, people are busy. People run busy lives. Now you say, there's screenings for the Oscars, we're on this film being shown, that film being shown. Which one are you going to go to? Something that just tells you we're showing here, or something that says, come, we'll give you champagne, we'll give you biscuits, we'll give you nuts, we'll give you a lovely screening, so and so will be there. So that personalized promotion of Oscar films, which costs the studios anywhere up to half a million dollars per film, that has to be in place. Plus all the ads in the trade papers saying, for your consideration, this film, this director, this actor. So uh, if something doesn't work, fix it. I'm constantly amazed when I go to all these functions across India, and I conduct a lot of corporate functions for film festivals and corporate events and award ceremonies, etc. Elementary things like podiums and, and microphones and uh, projection facilities are bad. And I'm constantly saying, why, can it, why is it bad after all these years? Didn't somebody learn a lesson somewhere along the way? You know, there's a manufacturing technique the Japanese have, I forget the exact name, it's called Kirinatsu or something, which means making small but significant e changes each day in your processes. Which is why, bit by bit by bit by bit, they end up making the best quality cars because they take out bit by bit, not in one big big bang reforms. Day to day, changes. the same thing can apply to your life. Small significant changes every day that propels you towards your goals. Um, and you have to also question whether your goals are, are realistic. I mean, at my age, if I want to be a spaceman, you know, it's a bit unrealistic, so I have to taper down my desires. It has, to be, it has to be reasonably realistic. No harm in reaching for the moon, provided you're of the age where you can be sent to the moon, um, or fit enough to be sent to the moon. So don't limit your dreams, but do a reality check. Sometimes, you know, the morning after, the, the ideas don't quite sound quite so realistic. So always do that reality check um, in terms of the ideas and the ideas also, you see, there's many ideas, ideas a dime a dozen. It's what you do with them that makes the difference. You, if I did this and this, I got so and so and so and I got so and so and I got so and so to cook and so to promote this, we could have a little restaurant here. Of course you can. You can have a restaurant anywhere. Do you want the job? That's the real question. Because all these things consume you. Every idea consumes you. Every idea is a jealous mistress. If you want to see it through, it's going to take your time. And time is the only thing you have and it's limited. So you can't pursue all the dreams at the same time. It's better to be a rifle bullet than buckshot. The rifle bullet penetrates as effect, makes a major impact. Buckshot spreads in 10 different directions, makes no big mark. So be sure that 
it's something that's worth doing, that you want the job at the expense of all the other possibilities, and then go ahead and do it. Because uh, it's not, you have to balance thought and action. If you think too much, you won't get anything done. If you just do without thinking, it'll already end up pointless. So balance thought and action.